Hi everybody, so today we're going to uh, talk about how to analyze uh, essentially our mechanics lab. Uh, so unfortunately, again, because of the remote teaching, we're not able to do this lab in person, which is really unfortunate because we finally are getting to break something. But uh, instead, we are going to uh, kind of just analyze the data and then figure out how to plot essentially stress strain curves. So we've talked about and we've seen this curve in previous lectures. Uh, again, this is where essentially your necking point would occur. Uh, and what we're going to do here is look at what we would have done in class is use this uh, Inspiron machine. Uh, you basically put your sample in between here. We're going to have dog bone shape uh, flat samples. So we have grips that are made for slat, flat versus uh, cylindrical samples. We were going to uh, pull this at a constant strain rate of 10 millimeters per minute uh, and basically our, uh, stretch our sample until it fractures and measure the stress strain curves. And so we're going to actually get that raw data and analyze that today. Uh, so, but that's what we would have done essentially if we were in person lab. And you can see this nice blast shield to make sure that there's no, uh, if it breaks, it doesn't pop back out at you. Um, so that would have been a nice experiment. This is uh, basically an image of the samples that we would have measured. Um, so we are going to need to know kind of this total, we're going to estimate the total volume and also the cross sectional area, which is just going to be this uh, width here, 0.53 inches. We're going to have to convert to meters. And then again, the thickness uh, of that sample is this eighth of an inch. So uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. It's going to be important, but let's take a look at our data. So the data is already given to you uh, kind of in uh, the lab handout. So let's first look at and their name kind of appropriately for their material. So aluminum, copper, high density polyethylene, and polystyrene is what we're going to kind of analyze in this lab. So uh, aluminum, copper, both metals. They're going to have very different behavior from high density polyethylene, which is a semi-crystalline material, and polystyrene, which is a amorphous material. So we're going to see some interesting behavior. You're going to see the high density polyethylene is going to be able to extend to extremely, extremely large uh, strains, high ductility before fracture, as opposed to polystyrene. Again, this is due to the, uh, the fact that high density polyethylene is semi-crystalline in nature, so the chains are able to kind of extend and recrystallize uh, while you're pulling which leads to that uh, kind of vast elongation. Polystyrene uh, is an amorphous material. They are not able to kind of rearrange uh, and recrystallize. So you'll see that uh, basically it fractures sooner than uh, high density polyethylene, but it's again, it's still more ductile than copper or aluminum. And again, you might kind of know from experience, copper should be more ductile than aluminum, but we'll kind of verify that and measure the, uh, the properties uh, in our lab. So let's start as we kind of usually, let's just take a look at our data. So. Let's go ahead and uh, paste it in here and see what we've got. So I'm going to import, and I'm going to treat it as data, and let's see what we have. Well, let's see what's happening here. I want to make this a little bit uh, simpler. So there's the extra parentheses, and I also just want to take, let's just say I want to take the first 30 uh, points. So let's look at that table form. So we have five, uh, basically five columns here. Time, displacement, uh, uh, force, tensile stress, and tensile strain. This tensile stress is kind of calculated from the experiment. We're not going to deal with this at all. Time is important. You can kind of calculate your strain rate, so just to kind of confirm that. But what we're really going to work with uh, in this lab is going to be the force that's measured and the tensile strain in percent here. So that's kind of a key feature here. This is measured from an extensometer. So an extensometer is a device that you put physically on your sample, and it measures uh, really precisely how much the material is straining. Um, the extensometer is good and bad. You're able to get really precise measurements, but again, you have to kind of physically put it on your sample, and if your sample extends too much, it will break. And uh, also, usually you kind of have to remove it while the sample is running, so that's kind of a dangerous aspect of it. But again, it gives us... Uh, Really, really, really nice precision uh, here. So we want to get to our stress strain curve. So we need to, you know, we know now what, how to define stress and strain. Luckily, this tensile strain is also given to us already in percents. You could also calculate it from this, just this, uh, this is the crosshead displacement. You could calculate strain from this, but it's not as accurate as these values here. So to calculate stress, I know that I am going to have to uh, basically normalize this by my area. So I'm going to define my area right now. And we know from looking at uh, it is the cross-sectional area, so we're pulling lengthwise along here. So the cross-sectional area would be that 0.53 times that eighth of an inch here. So it's the cross-sectional area from where the force is applied. So 
we want everything in meters, so 0.53 inches to meters, 0.0254, I would memorize that. It will be very helpful in your life. Uh, an eighth of an inch is 0.0254 meters again. So you have your area right there. So once you have your area, now we just want to kind of uh, obtain our values of, uh, well, actually, let, let's first, strain is going to be a little bit easier. So let's grab the strain value. So I'm going to take my data here. And I'm just going to, the first thing I want to do is flatten it to get rid of that extra parenthesis. So I'm going to flatten here one, excuse me, negative five point one. I meant to do that to show. <laughs> uh, then I'm going to take, I want all the data, all the rows, and I want to grab my strain. So I want the fifth column here. So the last column. You can also do minus one. Uh, you'll see that this is equivalent. Next one. You see here I have kind of this data point. I have these first two kind of uh, elements that I don't want. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to add on here, just take from the third element onwards. And that's going to be my strain value. So there's a little bit of an issue that you can kind of see going on here, right? Like we don't start initially from a zero strain. And it's just because, again, when we place your expensometer on your device, it's not initially, uh, basically, it's not zero. Uh, there's some initial kind of strain on the device. So we want to kind of rescale our all of our data to make sure that we start at zero. So what you can do uh, to kind of uh, do this is look at basically the differences in the strain between each of these successive points. So I want to take the differences of this data set. The differences, I just want to see like what's the change in the strain at each of these points. And now what I want to do is insert a zero at the beginning. Insert a zero here. Insert a zero at position one. And I also want to actually, before we even started that, I just want to kind of divide by 100 because again, we're given it in values of percents. So I don't want to deal with percents. I just want regular strain. So now I have this zero insert. I want to now accumulate this data because again, this is just giving me the differences. So I'm going to accumulate everything. So it's, this is going to add like starting from zero, add, you know, this, this gets added to this, then that result gets added to that, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to accumulate. And now I have all my nice values of strain here. So I'm going to go ahead and label that right now as strain. And then I'm going to suppress this output. So the strain is like this. And there you go. Stress, I'm going to do a very, very similar uh, kind of operation here. So again, I can start. I just want to kind of grab this data set. So I want to grab, uh, I want to grab here. So instead of the last column, I want to grab my force, which is the third column. So I want to grab the third column here. There we go. I, again, don't want those first two points, so three to minus one. I want to convert this to stress, so I'm going to divide by my area. You'll see, again, we don't start off with this uh, kind of first point here. So I'm going to do a very similar operation, just like we did previously. Uh, and we are going to, uh, we can't, we basically, uh, we can't do the differences here because we don't start uh, kind of from this initial, we have to subtract from this initial value of stress. So what I'm going to do here is do a little bit of a trick. I am just going to subtract uh, everything from this initial value. So I want to grab the first value here, excuse me, right here, uh, the parentheses over this. I want to subtract that whole list from the first data point. We could, in principle, do it just like we did the last time, but I'm just going to do this. It's a little bit easier. So all I have to do is subtract here. And now I start from zero, and everyone's happy now. So here, I've got my stress, and we should be almost good to go at this point. So that's my stress. I'm going to suppress that output. Now, I'm going to just label this as my AL data. And my AL data, I'm just going to transpose. I want one on my x-axis, I want strain on my x-axis, and I want my stress on my y-axis. Right here, here. There we go. 
So press the output again. And now I want to plot. So I'm going to plot this right here. I'm going to do, I copied this basically from an old notebook again. You can use the same kind of plotting format that we've been using, you know, throughout this, you know, uh, throughout our labs here. So I want my, uh, and I'm just going to plot. And there it is. My stress strain curve, this is in units of what? Pascals, as always. This is in units of strain, unit less. And here's our, uh, our plot for the aluminum stress strain curve. Now, what are we expected to do in this lab? Well, first we need to measure a lot of kind of properties. So uh, I want you to measure the Young's modulus, the yield stress, the ultimate tensile stress, the strain at failure, the strain at yield, and the toughness of the material. You can do uh, and grab the strain at yield, the yield stress, the ultimate tensile stress, and the strain at failure just by right-clicking on here and getting coordinates. So strain at failure, and then I'll let you figure out the rest of those values here. Where is my maximum, uh, where is my maximum, uh, my ultimate tensile stress is just the maximum uh, stress. So you could actually just look uh, at stress. So I could do, what is the max value of stress? And it will give it to me. So that's a quick hint on how to solve that problem quickly. But one of the harder problems to solve or one of the harder uh, quantities to uh, measure is going to be uh, basically the Young's modulus. But we know that's just kind of this linear region, right? So we need to find the slope. Luckily, again, in Mathematica, uh, please ignore that email. <laughs> uh, in Mathematica, we can approximate the slope by just grabbing some of these points. So I'm going to grab a couple of these points. And that's pretty sufficient. I'm going to control C. And I got my points here. So these are my data points. I want to fit this with a linear function. So 1x. I'm going to clear. Uh, looks like x is defined somewhere. I need to clear that. That's from a previous notebook. And we need to make sure uh, if it's blue, it's a variable. If it's black, it is already defined. So I want to fit this. And what is, uh, what is the Young's modulus of aluminum? Uh, typically, it should be about 69 gigapascals. So here, about 72 gigapascals, that's pretty good. That's pretty close approximation. That is a nice kind of result here. So you want to also not only tabulate these values, but also compare it to, uh, compare those values to literature. So look up literature values. What is the Young's modulus, ultimate tensile strength in these values, and see how they compare to our experimental values. Um, so that's basically how you kind of uh, uh, can do those problems there. The last thing to calculate the toughness. Toughness is one of the last properties that you're going to have to calculate here. That's a little bit more difficult, right? Because we need to we need to kind of calculate the total area in this curve and multiply by the volume. So in order to do that, we are going to have to use a, a function in Mathematica. It's called interpolation. So I'm going to do I function aluminum. You're going to do interpolation. So interpolation just basically approximates a, a curve to your data points. I'm going to take the data. And the first couple points are a little bit funky, so I'm going to just skip, and I'm going to grab from the 20th point onwards. And I want to, probably, yeah, it's not going to make, there's lots of points on here, and it's not going to make a difference. So that is my interpolating function. Now I have to integrate this function. So I have to integrate my function L from x, from x of 0 to the strain at failure. So I want to find out the maximum value of my strain. It is this value. I can just type that in here, max strain, and that's it. What units are this? is this in? It's the integral of the stress-strain curve, so it's in units of newtons per meter squared. We need toughness in units of joules. So you need to multiply this by the volume. Now, what's the volume of, of a dog bone shape? Pretty confusing. Um, you could you figure that out yourself if you want an exact uh, kind of value, or you could kind of just approximate this as like kind of this rectangular piece and... Uh, I'd be definitely sufficient with that. So uh, multiply this by the volume to get your uh, your values in units of joules. Um, so you're going to want to compare and uh, do this for all the rest of the three uh, kind of data points we have. So cover, you know, you have to do this for copper, HDPE, and polystyrene. Um, it might be beneficial to kind of plot multiple um, curves on a single point. So the way that you can do that is... Uh, you can basically just kind of show them on a single plot. And actually we could look at that just a second here. Um, so you could do show 
or you can just kind of put the uh, put the plots together. So one example is like this. Uh, actually, let me show you. And then the corresponding plot would be this. Uh, obviously, you want to clean up uh, the the framing and make it nice and neat like this plot. But again, if you want to kind of show comparisons between two different data sets, you can just kind of put them together like that. So that's one suggestion for uh, basically how you want to plot and kind of illustrate this data. So you can put the metals together, you can put the polymers together, you can put all the materials together. I wouldn't suggest that, but again, um, we'll kind of come to that once you start writing the report. But that's basically the nuts and bolts of how you do the data analysis for this lab. So um, I hope that was helpful. Again, if you have any questions, please email me, get started on this early, and uh, we'll get to kind of writing this uh, lab report. So after this, only one more left, corrosion, and we'll talk about that in the next video. Thanks. Have a good day.